Good evening. Welcome to the Berry Center and the Josephine Ardrey Foundation Distinguished Lecture Series. These presentations were begun as a way to support our agrarian community, the students in the Wendellberry Farming Program, farmers in our co-op Our Home Place Meet, members of the bookstore's Agrarian Literary League, thousands of Berry Center members and citizens of our rural community, our state, and our country. Our audience is those who have farmers and farm issues, soil health, farmer education, a diversified agriculture, a rich and diverse local culture, and a thriving rural community on their minds. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome the Honorable Judge John Logan Brent, Henry County Judge Executive, who has served in that position for five terms since 2003. He is in conversation with Mary Berry, Executive Director of the Berry Center. They will be talking about economic development in rural areas. In his 20 years in office, Judge Brent has inspired, encouraged, and shepherded numerous projects which are now contributing to the social and economic sustainability and resilience of our home place. Providing vital services in an area which suffered the loss of its economic underpinning when it lost its small family farms and farmers, farmers in the middle at the end of the tobacco program. During his tenure, he has led many projects, building a new public park. We have a new seniors center, a commerce park with a creamery and a meat processing and butcher shop. He led the effort to establish the Hope Center, a comprehensive center which pulls together resources to help those who struggle with addiction and mental health issues, things that were once thought to be problems only in urban areas. We have a sparkling, renovated, historic courthouse, and the downtown is sporting a new restaurant, Newcastle Tavern, one which takes pains to offer a variety of products from local producers on its menu. Mary Berry has been executive director of the Berry Center for 10 years. During this time, she has worked personally and tirelessly on all aspects of our center, growing our archival collections to include not only the papers of three great agrarians, her father, author Wendell Berry, her grandfather, John Berry Sr., and her uncle, John M. Berry Jr., but also the papers of the Burley Tobacco Growers Cooperative Association. She has overseen the work when we established the Tanya Amix Berry Agrarian Library and the bookstore at the Berry Center. She initiated the effort when we acquired the James Baker Hall photography exhibit, Tobacco Harvest Analogy, and the efforts when we established the farmer cooperative Our Home Place Meet and the Wendell Berry Farming Program of Sterling College, the junior and senior years of which take place here in Henry County. From the early 1950s and the beginning of the modern crisis in rural America, a crisis begun by big industrial interests and heralded by a directive from the Department of Agriculture to family farmers who had farmed for generations to get big or get out, to our current crisis, the pandemic, and its enduring effects, we're inspired to ask what will have to happen for us to make necessary changes to our culture. Tonight's discussion is about economic development in rural areas, the history of what's happened here in Henry County, and why this gives us hope for the future. In fact, this seems a special moment for hopefulness and an authentic pride in an enduring legacy of notable accomplishments for Judge John Logan Brent and our Executive Director, Mary Berry. The Berry Center was started to continue my family's legacy for small farmers and their communities. I think of Judge John Logan Brent as a successor to my grandfather, John Barry Sr., and my uncle, John Barry Jr. They had a deep love for the land and the people of Henry County, as John does. And, as they did, he has used his education for the good of his home place. I have counted on you for advice, counsel, and abiding camaraderie. You are conservative in the way I think they were, my uncle and my grandfather, not in the political sense, but in your desire to conserve what is good, what we have. 
My father has a handful of friends who, with his family, he says has made his work better. I thank you for being one of a handful of people who have done the same for me. I started the Berry Center to work on the problem of, of no local economy, not just the symptoms of that problem. So I think it uh, would help to set the stage a little bit. So um, I think our listeners need to understand that we live downstream from the prosperity and economic growth much celebrated as unprecedented, unprecedented by the cheerleaders of our economy. We see the degraded farms, forests, ecosystems, and watersheds, failing families, and perishing communities. You have dealt with all of this in your two decades as Henry County's judge executive, and you have watched it all happen as a citizen of Henry County. What makes you different, I believe, is that not only have you watched it happen, you have thought deeply about what is happening. You have taken seriously the idea that I keep coming back to in my own work. What has happened to our country place has not been inevitable. It has been destruction by design, which I actually think is hopeful because if we've been destroyed by design, then we need a new design. And so we're working to change that design. So let's talk about what, what is needed to make the changes that we talk about so much. Um, And so let's start, I think, with your own history. Um, Talk about your roots in Henry County and where you think your love for our shared home place comes from. Well, Mary, first of all, thank you um, for those kind words, especially putting me in the same sentence with your grandfather and and your uncle. And not your father, but we're certainly allies as well, as you and I are allies. And um, the... um, after 20 years of public service, I, I, where I am in life is, you know, your neighbors are next to family. Your neighbors are most important. Then I'll take my allies and then friends uh, because your neighbors and your allies are who you depend on and certainly been blessed to have you in that role. Uh, as far as my life and <clears throat> where I am and why I I love Henry County and this place so much. I think it would probably start with um, the fact that I'm an only child raised by older parents who were raised by older parents. Uh, I grew up. Do they know you're going to say that? I've said it a million (laughs) times. You know, I grew up surrounded by old things, old people, old farms, old barns. Even if the cows were young, they were always referred to as old cows. (laughs) But uh, certainly surrounded by history and most importantly old stories and I think that probably shaped me in an early age and led me uh, into this love of place and into public service you know I think about my grandmother who I was really close to she was born in 1899 died in 2001 and I had a direct link into a different time uh, through my relationship with her. She told me about she and her father, who was the local blacksmith, riding in their Surrey, and the horse was scared to death, and the first car she ever saw in Camelsburg came around her and went on up uh, the lane. And so uh, that, that notion of perspective that you get from knowing about what the economy used to look like, what um, all of those things that go into that culture used to look like. And, and you, and you kind of look and, and you take the pieces throughout a long period of time. And in that case, you know, I've had exposure for 120 years of what was good and what was bad and what could be. And, uh, that is one thing that shaped me, and certainly the other thing that shaped me is I fell in love with nature and the land and farming at a very young age. And we have a beautiful landscape here in Henry County, and that's just a part of my life and who I am, and I'm just very passionate about that. I would not be able to have been the public servant I've been um, wouldn't have been the um, 
husband or parent that, I, that I've tried to be, uh, you know, with without the land, it's allowed me to keep my sanity, basically. Well, we share th that feeling, I think, about our home place. Uh, I never wanted to live anywhere but Henry County, Kentucky. Um, never and never understood why anybody would want to live anywhere else. And I was also thinking as you were talking how history shortens as we get older. Um, you have a direct tie back, what did you say, 120 years? Mm -hmm. Um, and to think about what's happened to Henry County in that 120 years is, is really mind-boggling. Um, in my own work here at the center, um, the idea of an inventory has been indispensable. I started with the idea of, of working with what we had, had then, that was 10 years ago, what we had um, and if you think about what you have, then you begin to think or should think about what's missing, what was here that's not here anymore. Um, I think this kind of thinking is essential to doing good work in a particular place, along with living with the mistakes you make. <laughs> but um, um, I think you have used the idea of an inventory in your own work. Um, you have quite a list of accomplishments, and I'd like you to tell us some about them and to tell maybe a little bit about how they, how you thought about what you have to work with in order to think about these things that you know our county needs. Okay. Well, that's a big question. Um, when I think about, uh, you asked about accomplishments, uh, I guess, you know, the First, we need to start with that my family, my my children, and my wife that I'm all very proud of, and and uh, at a personal level, the farm uh, we started out with our home and about 18 acres, and have grown it to 160 acres, and continuously make improvements to the house and the farm, and it's really a life's work um, trying to make a place out of a farm and you know about that and I think you could you spend your life getting to know a farm yeah and and then certainly you know my my faith my relationship with God I I talk to God many times throughout the day and and I and I bring that up to say this that uh, many times on the way to work I would have one short prayer and that would be help me leave this place better than I found it and so um, if you get into the public service piece, hopefully those accomplishments, they're more about stewardship. And this notion of caring for a place, caring for a farm, caring for your family, caring for a community of people. And, you know, truthfully, uh, for me, my service in that stewardship, it's not so much about a a want to help people, but a, an obligation to help a place. And um, it's, it's what you're doing here at the Berry Center. It's, uh, you know, you've got a history of helping a place. And um, so that's some of what you're trying to do, some of what we're trying to do in the community. And, you know, we can point to a few examples, uh, especially, uh, community building pieces. One thing would be the Harvest Showcase. We started that event in 2000. Uh, I was working for Community Farm Alliance at the time. There were a group of local farmers that had uh, established, and you were one of them, had established uh, the farmer's market here in town. And you all had, had a kind of a successful one day event mm -hmm. with that. And Yeah, I believe it was called Lunch at the Farmer's Market. Yeah, and so, that tagline actually got added to the Harvest Showcase for years. It may have been dropped by now because we're in our 21st year. Uh, but basically we created this, this festival, this event, that is the largest local ag festival in the state of Kentucky. And we've had as many as 4,000 plus people come to it. And 
I chaired that for about 14 or 15 <laughs> years. Many years. And, um, you know, it was like all public service, it was more good than bad, but, you know, it, it, uh, it took a lot of work to put that one day together. But it did several things. One, it did the practical, which it got people out of uh, Louisville and the surrounding urban areas and introduced them to farmers and hopefully uh, helped our economy. It certainly helped it for the day, but hopefully some relationships were made. But more than that, it's been a pride building piece. And that is so important because we've lost so much, as you know, when you think about the prominence of our small towns and our retail establishments here that have been sacrificed because of the box stores in the surrounding regional economies. And uh, to have that one day, and, and especially the older people who remember what a thriving local economy is like, I think they really appreciate that that one day, that one day event. Yeah, I think for, um, it feels to me like sometimes that we have, um, our small farms and our small towns have basically just been evicted from the economy. Yeah. I mean, it simply isn't anything to support them. And our efforts have been, have been all about trying to put something back together that should never have come apart. Um, I remember those initial talks about Harvest Showcase uh, in the basement of the Newcastle Baptist Church. Yeah. And I, I believe we said then, um, we're just tired of all the bad news. We're here. Mm -hmm. We're farming every day. Um, we want to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, and it's still going. I, I'm not in the leadership of it anymore. The Berry Center sponsors it, but there's new leadership there and it has evolved and it's still happening and it's going well. So that's certainly one thing that I'm, that I'm very proud of, uh, for sure. Um, through over the years, I've been able to develop, uh, a commerce park and I've been able to develop a recreational and services park, both from scratch. We took that from the bare land, and we had to uh, go after the money for the infrastructure. We had we worked on a number of grants. Uh, we lobbied to get money. It was both were long-term projects, and I'm proud to say that both the recreational park, which has soccer fields and uh, Foot, a football field, and as well as services like the health department, the senior citizen center, um, it ha uh, a splash pad, and a um, just a number of things that it's full now. And the commerce park, um, which uh, we received the first direct federal appro appropriation for a project that I know of in Henry County, and and uh, worked on that. Um, it is now finished, it is now full, and it's mainly comprised of agricultural-based businesses. Which was there. your vision from the start. Which was my hope, <laughs> and I'll be quite honest, I didn't know if it would work out that way, but it did. And certainly we need to talk about one of those Absolutely. businesses because it's, it's, a, it's a good story and it's critical to what we're trying to do in the community uh, and through the Berry Center. And, and that business is Trackside Butcher Shop. Mm -hmm. And they were the first business to locate mm -hmm. there in the Commerce Park. And I remember going with your father to a number of meetings in Louisville and, and, and the conversation would always turn on the way home to, we need a butcher shop, you know. 30 years ago, we had, or in the 1970s, we had several of those. They all went kind of away sometime in the 70s or, or early 80s here. Um, when was not the only person talking about that. I mean, uh, a number of farmers, a number of people in the community, is, as folks often do, say, well, somebody ought to do something <laughs> about that. Well, um, right. you know, that kind of takes me back to that stewardship and that obligation. It's, it's uh, who is that somebody? I've yeah. always felt convicted that as much as possible, I guess, when you're in leadership, that somebody is you. Well, I think in, our, in all our lives um, that somebody is you. 
I mean, we've got to take part. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, before we go on, um, we've got a lot to say, I think, about Trackside Butcher it's Shop. It's important. Yeah. Um, it's very important. And um, as you're saying, it it always comes down to a person, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Who, it really uh, does. To take, so, take something up. Those, somebody's got to be the, the daddy or the mommy of the project. Take the risk. Yeah. Take the risk. Um, I believe that uh, to deal with the change needed in our county and really rural America uh, and maybe everywhere rural in the world, um, we've got to deal with agricultural and cultural problems. Um, and that and the work to change particular places, the most meaningful work, it seems to me, is coming from the ground up. It's not to go with what we're just talking about. It's not waiting for somebody else to do it. It's doing it. Um, at a meeting here of young farmers, gosh, some years back, uh, my husband said to that group, you know, that was in the very early days of talking about what our home place meat has become. Mm-hmm. Um, my husband said, um, Steve Smith is my husband, <laughs> said, um, the cavalry ain't coming. Right. We've got to do, we've got to help ourselves. Right. And, um, and certainly that's what we're trying to do, you and I and all of our allies. Um, your work in Henry County attests, I think, to the truth of that idea that from the ground up comes um, the good work. Maybe not 100% of the time, but often. Um, you've been an elected uh, official for 20 years, which is hard to believe. I'm wondering about the changes you've seen in your tenure as judge. And I will I'll, um, end that question with... Um, a little, just a feeling I have that just lately it seems a little, uh, there seems a little more energy behind some things going on in the county. Sure. I mean, it's building, I think. Good well, things. Well, that's a local, uh, a local, a loaded question, you know, the changes that I've seen. I, I, I would have to make this comment, first of all, politically, when I ran the first time, uh, the my predecessor said, you don't have to spend any money, you just need $50 to buy some business cards and you need to go knock on every door. And I was fine with that because that's about work and it's about relationship building and it's about community and it's about those things that, that we're for and we love. Um, today that's not the case. Someone with an iPhone with enough Facebook followers literally has as much power to influence people as did the William Van Hawkins of the world who you know well who ran the local uh, farm store Mm -hmm. that signed my papers when I first ran for office. It's a totally different game even at the local level now than it was um, 20 years ago. So and I, and I know that's maybe not what you're, you're probably wanting to know more about the comedy, but I have to say that because it really, that really changes the way you interact with the community too. It certainly does. And it, and uh, that, that's going to leave the two of us way behind, <laughs> isn't it? But uh, neither one of us are busily. Uh, no, I've never had Facebook no, or been on social media. But, um, but it also, it seems to me it's, um, Cheapened the conversation. It, your dad on right is cheapened we're, the conversation. We're just not talking deeply, or and people are, it's people are leading with hysteria, often it seems to me. They are, and and especially at this level, especially developing a community. You know, it's uh, you go around and see where the needs are, and then you try and see what is feasible to do. I mean, there's some things that are they're just not feasible. You know. Um, uh, it's funny, you know, various people want different things. And, you know, when you're campaigning, they'll, they'll say, well, what we need in Newcastle, Kentucky is a, is a shoe store for people to shop <laughs> at. Well, and I, I heard that at one forum I was at. It ain't going to happen. Uh, not for some years to come. 
But what? But then we talk about, and we talk about this all the time. But what could happen? Well, we could support a really good restaurant, and it's happening right now. And it's now. happening. Um, we know. Uh, I know in my case that my children drive in all directions, twenty minutes to get a good cup of coffee. We could support a good coffee shop here in town, and and we're we're reaching out trying to work on that. So, you, you know you. There are things that you can do, and you and you try and make sense of those things, and then uh, figure them out. And um, as far as the changes that I've seen, uh, we we see more and more loss of um, of those local economies, especially in the retail sector. Just. Uh, retail has not been able to survive. These big box stores in Henry County is just not far enough away from these regional economies right. to survive. You do see examples of places that are small, that have small towns like Henry County that are doing a little better. And in almost all of those cases, unless there's just been a, out, a, a pouring in of outside wealth, they're, they're usually places that are far enough away logistically to make it such that people stay and shop there and spend their money there. And, you know, we've talked about this a number of times. What would that take? Well, you know, um, I thought maybe $8 gas will do it, but it, in the last 20 years, that or in the last 12 years since 2008 kind of made the way people think uh, when gas went to $4 a gallon. And we heard lo the local retailers that were left here talk about what a great year they had mm -hmm. that year. Uh, and, and I kind of had this notion of, you know, diminishing fossil fuels, price of cost of gas going up, maybe that will lead to some of our salvation. However, I think the technology and the trends with, uh, we can't depend on that anymore either. Uh, or even that hope of that, or I don't know that hope would be the right word, but even that notion of that happening because uh, with battery powered cars and such, um, people, people are just in this, this habit of travel at the drop mm -hmm. of a coin. That's right, Dan, that's right. Well, I, I do hope for, um, I hope that people will begin to, to understand the truth of, of this, that there is nothing cheap, nothing cheap. And these ideas that uh, we could talk about solar power, you might want to talk a little about that. Um, we could talk about battery powered cars. We can talk about green this and that. But we're a land-based economy, and it's all coming from somewhere. And um, we can't continue to live the way we have lived and expect things to get better. We can't. It's not going to happen that way. And I feel often that uh, you and I, that the people who work at the Berry Center and so many other places, are trying to come up under what's coming apart with something <laughs> that will, that's foundational. Yeah. Yeah. So that if uh, if we if people can't afford to get what they need um, in Louisville, they might find it in Newcastle. Um, I think that's a perfectly legitimate hope, and I think most hope. I think it's fine to hope. I think being optimistic is often um, <laughs> maybe useless in a way. My father often says that optimism and pessimism are two sides of the same coin. And either one, with either one, you don't have to do anything. It's all either going to be bad or it's all going to be good. <laughs> there you go. Um, so we're so, stuck in the middle, so we're, sw we're, swimming hard. <laughs> we're, stuck with, we're stuck with hope, and I'm okay with that. Um, so there have been, over the last 20 years, there have been many changes. In my lifetime, there have been many changes in the... Um, you hearken back to 1899, your grandmother's, um, when your grandmother was born, uh, John Barry Sr. was born in 1900. Mm -hmm. And to think of the knowledge, the culture that has been lost in this place, 
um, well, it's it's hard to get your mind around all that we've been lost and how all that has been lost and how quickly we've lost it. But I think in particular, the loss of the Burley Tobacco Program changed our county, um, changed the culture of our county in ways that we can quantify and in ways that we can't. But maybe just quickly, um, you might give a little idea of what the program was and also how you think it, the loss of it has changed Henry County. Quite frankly, the program came about after years of struggle, up and down economies, the same type of economies that we face on a commodity stage today with all of our commodities, uh, times of boom and times of bust. And, you know, tobacco sold well, uh, for example, during war years and, and uh, certainly during short crop years, as, as always happens. Mm -hmm. uh, if the demand, we, if the supply's down. We talk about, you know, in order for one farmer to do well, uh, some uh, their neighbor has to do bad, and, and that's a sad state of affairs to be in. It certainly uh, is. And uh, so uh, during, the, during the Depression, as, as everybody's watching is, heard of uh, and knows about many of those New Deal programs came out and 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 it had been crisis and out of crisis folks had been thinking uh, about how to make things better and so that well, that for a crisis while, country didn't, people were valued didn't come about at country people were valued a, a significant percentage of the United States population at that time lived in the country and and so with that, uh, a number of programs came out in all commodities, and tobacco was actually one of the last ones, but your grandfather and maybe one or two other men basically had this vision of a, of a program that would give price protection that the system would create an equal playing field for small and large farmers alike. Right. and. Um, and it would uh, give protection from what we've, what continues to be the case. It was the case then in that we had monopolies and oligopolies, and it's the same way in agriculture now. When you think about three grain companies controlling 80%, 80 or and this is an old stat, but 80% of the grain trade in the United States, it hasn't changed. So right. basically, um, we, he was able, along with a little help, to engineer this program and that gave for 60 plus years um, a mechanism for uh, average folks, many times poor people, One, protecting to, them. to advance themselves and to become land-owning, middle-class citizens. That's right. And along the way, it built every town that we have in this community, and it built an infrastructure. In my little town of Camelsburg, you ask what I've seen lost in 20 years because of that tobacco program. When I was a kid, and even up until my youth, um, you know, there were two tractor dealerships, there was a farm supply store, there were two hardware stores, and we've lost every single one of those post-tobacco program right. leaving. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really difficult. We, we basically, we, our economy was an agricultural economy that had a strong retail and uh, a strong agricultural service mm -hmm. industry. And so what I've seen lost in the last 20 years is basically most of that retail and most of that agricultural service industry. And, and um, the service industry, industry certainly has been lost because of the tobacco program going out. The retail is more complicated than that, but partially because of the mm -hmm. tobacco program. Well, we had a leaving. thriving farm culture and we had the infrastructure to support it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think maybe it's important to, to say a little bit about the, the kind of agriculture that the tobacco program supported. Um, the average farm was 100 acres, yeah. maybe a little less. Um, and these were highly diversified farmers. Um, in fact, probably up until maybe the early 70s, a lot of those farmers were subsistence first, um, good land users. Um, one of the important things that we should point out about the tobacco program is, is that it allowed for a small amount of plowed ground yep. to um, support a family's economic life for a year. And they could plan a year around that. that. Now, um, now we lost the we lost the tobacco program in two thousand four, and there were there were things that are too complicated and long to talk about. The, the program weakened over yeah. years over the years because of global trade and all kinds of other things. Um, uh, there's some wonderful essays by my father that, <laughs> if people want to know more about about that uh, those changes, um, they can read those those pieces. Um, but I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about the changes, some of the changes that, that happened in our county are quantifiable. We know how much the tobacco money turned over, how much a dollar turned over, what is it, seven times? Seven times. Um, in a local community. Uh, 2,000 total gross personal uh, income uh, tobacco being a percent of that was about 9%. Tobacco sales were about 9% of all uh, gross personal income in the county. Uh, tobacco, we were, let's see, you know, maybe 20 million in, in sales of tobacco a lot of those years, uh, more in some. And then you've got the, those dollars turning over seven times and it's just about all but gone now. And, uh, you know, we can go a lot of places with this, but one thing that I think is important to mention, there's, there's, there's several things that, that we've been talking about lately, um, and we may or may not get to those, but one thing that's really important is this cultural piece of what the tobacco program did. And... What it did was it was a community crop, it was a family crop. It it it's it implied cooperation and it implied that people had to be together to make it work. Well it was a it it was in its effect an economy of cooperation, not competition. So people worked together and in that way uh, got themselves out of the money economy to some extent. Um, yeah. Uh, but it also fostered a kind of community that I think I took utterly for granted. <laughs> and um, certainly the economy, the corn and grain economy that has replaced it has not done no. anything. No, it's all, Paris, about, it's all about independence. It's all about independence. It's all about personal, uh, what, you, what you, the individual, need. It's all about a bid bidding against your neighbors for land lease. You know, we've got a farmer, uh, the next county over, that's up to 12, 15,000 acres now. Mm -hmm. Now think about how many 100 acre farms that was just 30 years ago. Yeah, just think about all the people, as I said earlier, that have been evicted <laughs> from the economy. Um, I think that it's it warrants saying that even though or because we lost the tobacco program because of health concerns, and I don't think either one of us would would quarrel about the health concerns, but I will say what replaced it, um, the corn and soybean economy, that has done nothing for the health of, of, the, of the land, the people. It's toxic, it's erosive, and people are going... Uh, uh, people are going out of business doing it. Well, there's two things that we've got to touch on before we leave tobacco. One thing is that the tobacco program has ensured the scale was right. That's right. And That's we right. talk about scale all the time, and we, 
craft our policies at the Berry Center around scale. Uh, we think about scale when we think, you know, that's something that's always on my mind in local government is trying to get the scale right. And even in economic development, you'll talk to folks that have been successful in traditional models, industrial models, and they'll tell you, we'd much rather have 10 factories that employ 100 people than we had one factory that employs 1,000 because if the one factory that employs 1,000 goes away, you're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And and so, so there's some practical lessons there, but also on the scale of tobacco, it was a, it was a high margin, low, um, you did not have to own a lot of equipment to make it work, and it was a very high margin, and so, and it did not take a lot of line, land, and so that scale manifested itself in a lot of important ways. The environment was a big one. Absolutely, absolutely. And because I always do this, because I've uh, heard so much, there's so much negativity around tobacco, I want to make it clear that you and I are talking really about the, the program and the principles of the program that worked for small farmers. Tobacco is not coming back. We're not, we're not looking to bring tobacco back or interested in that. What we're interested in um, are small farmers, good land users, being able to make a living farming. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so that seems then a good time to talk about um, our home place meet, um, the, work, uh, the work that we've done. Um, you've been invaluable to our work with our home place meet as a farmer, as a participant, as I don't think I've mentioned yet that you're a board member of the Barry Center, sure. and so that you you've been involved, um, you've given a lot of time and a lot of uh, probably a lot more time than I know thinking about um, our home place meet. Um, what do you think the value of is, of our home place meet is? And, and let me preface the, that by just saying that we at the Barry Center have taken the principles of the Burley Tobacco Program meaning that we'd like to protect farmers from overproduction. We'd like to pay farmers a parity price, meaning that they, they get cost of goods sold back and make a little profit. Um, we can't replicate a federal program, but we've tried to work on a program that gets a fair, a fair priced product to the urban eater, mm -hmm. but that takes into consideration the farmer first, the farmer and his or her land, um, and so on. So um, what do you think the value of this effort is? Well, from a I'm hoping you think it's important. Uh, well, I've worked on it. <laughs> uh, we've worked on it. Uh, we put a lot of hours into it, so uh, yeah, we're pretty bought in. From a practical standpoint, farmers are generally not entrepreneurs and marketers, and so uh, from, from that alone, uh, the thought is that uh, you know we can come together, and the Berry, Berry Center can provide those resources to help get this deal off the ground, help establish the markets, and then um, I don't. I think the long-term goal is at some point that um, we're the mama of the project now, but at some point, you know, it is turned over to the farmers. Absolutely. And that's the goal all along. We're not there yet, but we're making making strides at that. Um, so that is very important. If there's folks out there watching or listening, and we know that there are farm entrepreneurs out there that have been very successful at that, but if we if we think about that in terms of our community here, you know, it's less than a handful out of out of well, a diminishing number of farmers, but still five or 600 farmers, mm -hmm. and it's less than a handful that are really entrepreneurial type farmers. Mm -hmm. And so the Berry Center uh, has, with some of this work that we're, we're doing through our home place is, is helping establish the markets. And then, um, and, and um, we're also trying to create a, a model to show people that you know, it, it can be done, right? There's hope. It's back to this Harvest Showcase com, uh, concept that you have to have examples to point to. Absolutely. We're desperate for examples, and we're hoping our home place meet can help other 
places, other groups of farmers. And I, I th- I'd like to talk a little more about the entrepreneurial example. Um, you and I both have great admiration for some of the entrepreneurial work going on in this county. I mean, there's some brilliant farmers, good farmers, um, doing really wonderful work. And when I go to Louisville, I hear about um, um, what they're doing and and how beautiful their vegetables are and so on. I mean, it's, it makes me very proud. But there's a limit to that. You, um, If all the farmers, say all the farmers in Henry County were entrepreneurial and every single farmer in, in Henry County decided to have a CSA or show up on, at farmer's market, markets, they would very, some of them would be, would go out of business. Sure. There's not, there's no um, controls on that. There's not, the scale is not understood. Um, so it seems to me that it's in, terribly important to think about um, an entity that works on behalf of a group of farmers. Um, and that's, uh, that's certainly what we've done here and what I um, hope <laughs> uh, continues and, and becomes um, owned by, uh, that our home place meet eventually is owned by the participants. Absolutely. If, if we don't go for self-sufficiency, then that's silly. Right. It's just silly. But on that note, I wonder what you think as a board member of the Berry Center about about the fact that the Berry Center has given this program time. Um, I've seen an awful lot of co-ops come and go, and I can tell you from you and I both know, if someone had had to live, or more than a couple of people had had to live entirely out of this program while trying to work out all the problems, it wouldn't exist today. It needed time. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would. I would totally agree with that. Uh, there is no way we could have. The money was just, you know, you can charge. We have a premium product, so we can charge a premium price. But getting that off the ground, there's not enough margin in that average product price and that premium product price to be able to pay for a market manager, a coordinator of the farmers, of those type of things. If it was not for the Berry Center, and and who is the Berry Center ultimately, but our donors yeah. and the people that believe in our work, if it wasn't for those people that believe in what we're trying to do. And, and you know, the Berry Center is involved in a, in a lot of different things, but and I and I've talked about it, and 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 you're passionate about all those things, and I, and I'm passionate as well. But as I've as you know, I mentioned to you before, I, personally, I think this is the most important leg of that table because it's the countryside piece. It's the piece that it's the real piece. And again, if we can't give examples of hope out there that you can develop markets and there there is a way um, to nip away at this thing, well, then and, what can the Berry Center do? And you can pay a fair price and, and have a fairly priced uh, product for consumers. You can do it. You can, pair, you can pay a fair price to farmers and get something to market that's affordable, which we are doing. The work of uh, Our Home Place Meet is important for so many reasons, for the lives of the farmers we're working with, for the hope they have that they can continue to farm. But it also uh, was my dearest hope when I started the Berry Center that the tobacco program, which appeared to me to have been forgotten in very short time, that interest in it would be revived, not in tobacco, but in the principles mm-hmm. of talking. The local food movement has left out an awful lot of <laughs> so, yeah. economic work. In fact, my husband says that the local food movement has never hit the countryside. Right. Um, so, so our home place meet is dear to me because I think it continues the work of my grandfather and my father and my um, uncle John. 
But all of it is important. Sure. Um, all of the work of the Berry Center is important because we need a culture that will support good farming economically, but we need a culture that will support it culturally mm -hmm. so that more people understand that we all live from the ground. We all live from the health or the disease of the ground. So... Um, We know that our work is to restore um, health and prosperity. Our hope is to re restore health and prosperity to rural places. Um, our friend Wes Jackson, who uh, started the Land Institute in Kansas, sa says that you aren't thinking big enough if you think your work will be done in one lifetime. I don't, I know, I don't believe in political solutions anymore. Uh, we've talked about change coming from the ground up, and that's where I believe it's it's going to come from. And then I'm perfectly happy to tell politicians what I think we need. You are certainly an exception <laughs> to anything, any way I have tried to understand the people who feel called to public service. And, well, I'm not sure I think they feel called. Um, I think a lot of people are ambitious, and so they go into public service. Um, to work for 20 years for the good of your place is such an example. I mean, we said that we need good examples, and your example is an important one. Um, you've even become something of a writer in the last years. Uh, I always wrote a little bit. I just had time to actually uh, <clears throat> take it from my head and, yeah. <laughs> and get it down. How much did your friend Wendell say you'd have to write to uh, support yourself? Well, we, I, I think I worked 24 hours on the piece I, that I submitted, and I got $100 for it, which I was grateful to get that. <laughs> but at that at that math, I think he said I was going to have to turn out about 400 pieces mm -hmm. uh, a year, which I don't think that adds up to enough hours in a year. <laughs> well, he'd know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, I, let's let's end this conversation with hope. Uh -huh. um, let's. Where does your hope lie? I think there's slivers of hope, and hopefully, you knit those together into a greater hope. So, for this little community, what do slivers of hope look like? Slivers of hope look like uh, the gentleman who we have been working with for the last six months who started a restaurant who literally came through Newcastle, Kentucky over a period of 10 years to participate in a, in a golf scramble here and fell in love with the little town and is actually trying to do something. And we have been selling our home place beef to him over the last four weeks and he is using 100 to 100 and 30 or 40 pounds of hamburger a week, which is significant. That's amazing. I think that little restaurant called the Newcastle, Newcastle Tavern, uh -huh. right across the street from the Berry Center. I'd love to invite all of our friends yeah. to come see us and to have lunch at the or dinner mm -hmm. um, at the Newcastle Tavern. Um, so that translates in real, real terms. That gentleman, that restaurant, could literally support one to two farmers' incomes a year. That's amazing. If, and 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 so that 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 uh, we talked about that dollar turning over. Mm -hmm. That that's so that's a sliver of hope. Um, you know, this 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 butcher shop that was built that that we kind of skipped over a minute ago. These these two relatively young men that, that left pretty daggone good jobs and, and took a great chance and now have 20 employees, paying them a living wage of up near $20 an hour and they're booked up for a year and now they're on their second expansion. And, it, and the community came around them and supported them from local grants to, to the bank and then they basically put up their lives as well to make this work. That's a sliver of hope. Um, and there are a number of, of those places that I can point to. Uh, 
to give people hope. Now, there are a lot of forces out there against us. Um, you mentioned um, large-scale solar just a second ago, and I, I think I've got to say that before we leave today. I am as concerned about this large-scale solar issue, which they call solar farms, mm -hmm. as anything that I've seen in the last 20 years, and very quickly to put it together, it's not about scale. Some of these sites grow to 1,600 acres, taking 1,600 acres of land out of use for 30 years, and then the footprint of that and the potential of outside companies, outside entities from Miami, Florida, from Salt Lake City, Utah, these are real, real companies, real places that are looking at Henry County offering huge dollars for lease. And you think about the perfect recipe to divide neighbors mm -hmm. and community. Well, and, and we're talking about this as two people. I mean, my most, if you will say, in the political spectrum, my most liberal issue would be the environment. And I mean, you're, you're talking to, we're sitting here as two people that care extreme. I mean, our, the environment and, and this land has been our life and our greatest passion. But we're not going to save the world. We shouldn't be expected to save the world at the cost of this community. Well, the, and, the, and, and again, uh, we're seeing agricultural land, prime agricultural land, undervalued for the sake of cheap energy. I just met with, I just met with someone uh, before coming here an hour and a half, and I said, how are they finding us? Oh, they just look on GIS and do a top-down view, and who, whatever land is closest to the transmission lines, that's how they identify it. They don't care about who lives in this community. They don't care about the people of this community. It's the same battles that are being fought forever. So that's, so that's what we're fighting. So yeah, we can sit here and talk about slivers of hope, but we can, but we're we're constantly, we're we're battling every day and and we need folks that are watching this to tell their friends to tell their neighbors um, to get involved to know that these struggles are going on and if they value places like Henry County Kentucky if they value being able if they don't live in rural places if they live in urban places but they still like to come to the harvest showcase and they still like to take drives out to countryside and they care about where their food comes from or they care, they, they see the value, they better get involved in the fight. Or maybe they see the hope that would lie in the fact that, say, Henry County, Kentucky and our surrounding rural counties could get good food to Louisville in good times and in bad. Well, that's true as and well. And if we don't hold on to the people who know, uh, no, hold on to the people who know how to use land well, f and uh, feed people from it, and grow that population, the, we're not going to have the capacity to feed our local urban places. The attorney that I met with, his uh, just a just a little while ago about this solar issue, he said, "Well, this is a way." to keep the farm in the family uh, for 30 more years. At the end of 30 years, who's gonna know how to farm that land? Well, uh, my, my father has, has said since I was a child, people think it's easy to farm because farmers can farm. That you don't need a you don't need a degree to farm. You don't need what people are used to thinking of as education. But you and I have both known uh, great farmers whose intelligence and abilities are indispensable to the to really our future. The farm prepared me more 
for my career in public service than any of my educate than any place that I attended college than any of my other experiences because it's about being creative, about being resourceful, about problem solving, all of those things that a farm teaches are what I believe are the essence of public service. Right, and all those things, we're hoping that the people involved with the Wendell Berry Farming Program of Sterling College that are Absolutely. learning. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard you say uh, several times in my hearing that you have a wish list, or you had a wish list for Henry County. I'm assuming you probably yeah. haven't gotten all your wishes no. fulfilled. What are your wishes? Well, I said years ago, if I could pick one thing that would, uh, one single entity to come to Henry County, I would love us to have a college. And voila, you just appeared on the scene and, and we now have the Wendellberry Farming Program and the, and the makings of a college. I mean, it's still, well, oh it's yeah, still in its youth. the beginning. But, um, you but know. But we do have students here using Henry County as a classroom and being taught by people who know how to value country places, so. So, so that would be at the top of the wish list. Um, certainly, uh, infrastructure around agricultural-based businesses would be at the top of the wish list. We, we've got the butcher shop, we've, we've talked about that numerous times, but you know, um, wish list, a pizza company, that had every component of that pizza had to be grown in Henry County. From the, the pork and the beef topping to the cheese from the dairy to the tomatoes from the sauce and you know, and literally that 20 ingredient pizza impacting 20 different farmers. You know, we can dream about all those type of things but, but this infrastructure piece would also be on, the, on that wish, wish list as well. Uh, that could support some of our, uh, some would support our local farmers. And, and um, certainly uh, I wish people valued shopping at home more and so we had more retail options here as well. Well, I don't think uh, that it's ever going to get so bad that a person of good intention can't do what's right in front of them to do. That's what we've done here, That's certainly what you've done. Um, my father believes that um, the work, this work, is certainly hard, but we better have fun doing it. <laughs> and I thank you for your work as a judge, as a farmer with us at the Berry Center and for making it all more fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you, John Logan. <laughs>